Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. A warm welcome uh, to all of you, and uh, what a delight to uh, have another uh, series by Walter. Uh, of course, this time on Jeremiah walking into and out of the abyss. How about that? Um, before I say a few other words, I want to thank all of the folks that brought food and that cleaned up and to let all of you know that if you didn't come tonight for potluck um, and you want to come, just show up. You can bring food or not bring food. Uh, fishes and loaves multiply every time in some way, shape, or form. So feel free to come. But thanks to all of you. Who and also, before I forget, um, we are uh, recording all of the uh, uh, presentations. And they will be available on uh, onecommontable.com uh, in a few days. Chris has not promised me a specific time, so don't hold him to it. But in a few days, on, they'll be on YouTube uh, uh, and available. Um, you know, I realize that um, in all the presentations that uh, Walter's given here uh, over the last uh, few years, uh, that I've never uh, begun a series by telling you what he's done. Because, um, of course, he's just one of the sheep that sits in the pew. And, um, and of course, if you were going to see him at some other venue, they would get up and they'd say things like, Walter Brueggemann received a bachelor's from Elmhurst College in 1955, three years before I was born. <laughs> he received a Bachelor of Divinity from Eden Theological Seminary in 1958, the year I was born. Um, a Doctor of Theology from Union Theological Seminary in 61, and a PhD from St. Louis University. I didn't know that. Wow. Um, he is the son of a German Evangelical Synod of North American uh, minister, and he himself was ordained in the Church, United Church of Christ. He is Professor of Old Testament, 6186, and Dean, 6882 at Eden Theological Seminary, uh, in that town where the Cardinals play. Um, and who are playing tonight. And are playing tonight. Um, and then beginning in 1986, he served as the William Marcellus McPeters Professor of Old Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary and retired in the early uh, 2000s. Um, and then, of course, his most significant move in the course of his life uh, was when he moved here in 2000. <laughs> Uh, author of nearly a hundred books, most of which have showed up in my little mailbox at some point or another. You know, it's amazing how uh, I get a book that's just come out, and then like two weeks later, another book's just come out. So, uh, <laughs> prolific, 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 um, and of course, countless uh, articles. So, if you go to the Athenaeum and you go to the catalog and you go to Brueggemann, you've got enough to read for uh, really the rest of your life. Um, well, Walter, as always, we are incredibly grateful that you're willing uh, to do this uh, for us. And, you know, for those of you who don't know, this last year at St. Timothy's, uh, starting a year ago, September, uh, a number, 200 people signed up at least, whether they did this or not, I don't know, because they don't tell me, uh, signed up to try to read the Bible in a year. We call it Bible 365. And uh, this last September, uh, this whole process ended. And one of the things that I think was very true about this exercise is that as people tried reading the Bible over the course of a year, they encountered all sorts of texts that they had never uh, engaged before. Some were very comforting and some were terrifying and uh, some were the kind of texts that came to me and said, Roger, what the heck is this doing in the Bible? Um, I think it was a good exercise for a congregation to see the lay of the land, but my guess is a good follow-up to a year like that is to try to take a book of the Bible and really plumb its depths. And uh, the book, of course, we're going to be doing this month is uh, is Jeremiah. So, Walter, thanks again for uh, being with us. And without further ado, Walter Rubin. Well, I'm, uh, I'm glad 
to uh, get to think about Jeremiah with you. It's, uh, if you were doing 365, you discovered that Jeremiah is a very complex book. And uh, you may have questions other than the ones I'm trying to answer. Uh, so we'll have some time to talk about that. So let us pray. You are the God who inhabits the scroll. We do not, do not know how, but we do not doubt it. We trust enough to say glory to you, Lord Christ, praise to you, Lord Christ, the word of the Lord, thanks be to God. We say it even about the weird, objectionable parts of the scroll, partly by habit, partly because we do not listen very much, partly because we hunger and want a word addressed to us. So we thank you for this radioactive scroll that has been set among us, for all our criticism and all our orthodoxy. It is not tamed or domesticated or made safe. Let it shatter and offend and heal and transform. For a minute tonight, position us in front of the scroll. Let us let it vex us and stir us and make us new. We pray in the name of Jesus, the sure child of the scroll. Amen. Amen. Well, it's appropriate that the uh, lectionary readings last Sunday were Lamentations 1 and Psalm 137. Both of them were uh, uh, texts of grief uh, about uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. So uh, I'm going to start there uh, by saying that uh, 587 and the destruction of Jerusalem is the key date in Jeremiah and the key date in the Old Testament. Everything works around the destruction of Jerusalem, which was the loss of the king and the temple and the city but it was also a crisis of faith because they began to wonder whether they were God's chosen people. So this generated all kinds of uh, theological wonderments and arguments and questions. And what happened because of 587, there were many, many commentators. So every poet, every scribe, every teacher, every rabbi, every priest, everybody had to make a comment. And that's how we got the Old Testament. <laughs> so you get interpretation about what did it mean. Uh, you get uh, reflection on how did this happen to us. And you get anticipation about what comes next. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some of that. Now, so you know how I interpret the book of Jeremiah, I want to suggest that our equivalent to the destruction of 587 is 9-11. 9-11, uh, historically, is a very small event. There were more people that die in violence all the time than died on 9-11. But it's a huge symbolic event. It is an event uh, in which all of the old certitudes were called into question and we discovered uh, that we are as vulnerable as other people in the world. And that's why the cry, I think 987 hit young people so hard because I think there are very many young people who had never entertained the thought that we would uh, be vulnerable. Uh, and with 9-11, like 587, there are many, many commentators. So every preacher, every editor, every writer, every poet, everybody tried to say something that made sense out of it. So uh, while I talk about this, uh, I'm going to be bootlegging this. I'm not going to mention it a lot, but the reason I, and you don't have to accept that, so that's why I put a dotted line, uh, but, but that's why I think our reading of the book of Jeremiah is pertinent to us, because at a distance we are facing something like that, even though we give uh, very 
a different nuance to it. Now, I don't know whether you noticed that I said my topic tonight is uh, history become literature. So I'm going to talk about history. And uh, uh, this probably won't interest you, but you've you got to know some of the history to read the book of Jeremiah. So I, what I want you to do is look in 2 Kings 24 for the history. Uh, really, 2 Kings uh, 23. Uh, uh, in verse um, uh, 2 Kings 23 is about the death of King Josiah, uh, where it says in verse 25, before him, Josiah, there was no king like him who turned to the Lord with all his heart and all his soul and all his might and all his strength, according to the Torah of Moses. He's the good king. So Josiah, can you see these little numbers up here? 626 to 609. 609, his son Jehoahaz, verse 31, uh, became king, and he reigned three months before uh, the Egyptians took him away. And his brother, Jehoiakim, in verse 36, they reigned 11 years, so that'll give you 609 to 598. You can trust me on these dates, it's okay. <laughs> and then his son, uh, Jehoiakim, in 24-8, was 18, and he reigned three months. And the Babylonians took him away. And then his uncle Zedekiah in verse 18, 24, 18, and he reigned 11 years. So in a span of, uh, what, 30 years, he got five kings, which means enormous instability. Uh, this three-month king was taken away by the Egyptians. This three-month king was taken away by the Babylonians. And the Bible regards these two kings as very bad kings. Now, the date that isn't written here, in uh, 609, you know the numbers go backwards, in 609, Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, was burned. And in 605, Nebuchadnezzar became the king of the Babylonians. Both Assyria and Babylon are Iraq. So nothing has changed about geopolitics. <laughs> and the reason this is so important, this date, is that when you read the uh, oracles that come here, the book of Jeremiah says this oracle happened in the seventh year of Nebuchadnezzar. So the, the people in Jerusalem are dating their life by the king of Babylon. And then right after 587, uh, you get the book of Lamentations that we read Sunday. So the book of Lamentations is the first uh, song of grief probably soon after the destruction and then uh, the book of Kings doesn't tell us anything well if you if you, if you uh, look uh, at the paragraphs that follow in 2nd Kings uh, 24 uh, or 25 uh, you will see in verse uh, uh, 7 the Babylonians slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah, the last king, and then they put Zedekiah's eyes out. They did play for keeps. And then uh, in the next two paragraphs, what you get is the plundering of Solomon's temple, in which they took away, verse 14, they took away the pots and the shovels and the stuffers and the offering plates and the microphones and the cross and everything of value. And uh, then uh, Nebuchadnezzar 
in verse 22, appointed a governor, so it became a colony. Uh, and nothing else is reported until the last paragraph, beginning at verse 27, in which this king, Jehoiakim, that lasted three months, is still in Babylon, in exile, and most people date that to 562 under the, ba the Babylonian ruler Evo Merodach. So this, nothing is said here. This is all uh, grief work. Uh, so uh, the reason this is important is that the book of Jeremiah uh, probably spans all of this. And uh, you can uh, spot uh, certain oracles that belong with certain kings and uh, stuff like that. So that's the history. and. Uh, what you get then after 587 clearly is that you get, uh, they, they deported the leading citizens uh, and you get fear and failure and despair and loss and sadness and denial um, because there were people that said we'll be back to normal in two years. Well, I read a book review uh, this week uh, it's called it's called when the money runs out and uh, the thesis of the book is that Western affluence will never come back and he names five things that will never happen again that produced our affluence so what we get in the body politic is denial despair anger, fear. I think that our current uh, unworkable political situation is probably a lot like that. Uh, so I think reading the book of Jeremiah works pretty well. Now, uh, I'll stop there to see uh, uh, whether you want to question that. that. That may be more specific historical data than you wanted to get and uh, you don't have to linger over it. You can always, you know now where to find it in 2 Kings 24 should anybody want you to name the last five kings of Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> any, uh, any question or comment? Well, from history to literature, uh, I, I think um, I think when we read the Bible, uh, we do not uh, enough take into account that it's literature. Uh, it's not report, not reportage, uh, it's not theology, it's not orthodoxy. It is artistic imagination in which the uh, poets and the storytellers construct and construe reality. So you, you may know that uh, the last 20 years we've had what is called a Jesus seminar in which uh, scholars are busy trying to figure out what words Jesus really said. This seems to me to be quite wrong-headed. What's interesting about the New Testament is how did these different people imagine Jesus? And so we have four versions of that, and uh, now they're about to publish uh, a Bible that includes the Gospels that didn't make the New Testament. There are more of them, which are other imaginations of Jesus. So what we have in the Old Testament, we basically have uh, 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 imagination around the crisis of 587, and uh, the poets and storytellers that do that imagining take huge poetic license. So the text is imagination, and then our interpretation is imagination 
about imagination. And then when we hear uh, one of our pastors imagine the text, we listen and we do our own imagination so that pastors regularly get thanked and, uh, and, and get anger after church for things they never said because we do our own imagining about what we imagine them to have said. So it's very slippery because you get imagination and you get imagination and you get imagination and I think uh, that somebody like the Jesus Seminar that's trying to pin it down, uh, I don't think they understand the kind of literature uh, that we have in our hands. Now, one uh, well, first of all, that these poets practice huge poetic license, and in Jeremiah you will find them using wild, uh, offensive uh, images and metaphors. But this is all held in check by the poet's commitment to the God of the covenant. Uh, and that means Moses and Sinai and the book of Deuteronomy. So what I think we have in the book of Jeremiah is artistic imagination that tries to interpret and understand the crisis of 587 with reference to the God of the Covenant because quite clearly in Jerusalem uh, there were people in the royal priestly elite who controlled the government and all the finance and everything who imagined the world without reference to the God of the Covenant. So the, 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 Jeremiah is like clapping with one hand and you have to imagine the other hand uh, that imagined the world without reference to God so that Jeremiah is a heavy contestation to say all interpretations of this without reference to the God of the Covenant are false interpretations and uh, he insists that this got to be at the center of our imagination. Now, the other uh, uh, preliminary uh, that I want to mention is that there is imposed in Jeremiah and uh, most of the prophets uh, a very simple calculus. Uh, that if you obey the Torah, you will get prosperity, and if you disobey, you will get adversity, and the prophets are continually harping on that. So if you look in Deuteronomy 30, you can see a succinct statement of that. Um, verse 15. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, verse 15. Chapter 30, verse 15. Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity. Everybody see it? Death and adversity. If you obey the commandments by loving and by walking and by observing, uh, then the Lord will bless you. But if, verse 17, if your heart turns away, uh, then you will perish. Therefore, 19, therefore choose life. Now, the Roman Catholic hierarchy thinks that's about abortion, but it's not really about abortion. It's about ordering public life according to the governance of the commandments. And uh, then it was not hard to see that 587 seemed to confirm uh, this uh, prophetic judgment that the adversity is the destruction and then they get into an argument about how the, how the uh, community of Jerusalem had disobeyed the Torah that brought that on. So uh, there are uh, very conservative interpreters who say that the disobedience in our society has to do with sexuality, 
and all the things are wrong. That's, uh, that's called pelvic theology. <laughs> and there are liberals uh, uh, who believe that the disobedience is economic and uh, having no safety net for the disadvantage that will lead to destruction. So we have that argument about what's the nature of the disobedience. And in, uh, in uh, Jeremiah, the disobedience is uh, the lack of justice. In, uh, Hosea, in Ezekiel, it's the lack of holiness. So you can see these uh, lining up pretty much uh, now the way they were then, arguments about justice and holiness or purity and cleanness, and there's biblical warrant for both. Uh, so what I want to do is to understand the, the book of Jeremiah as a uh, artistic rendering of this calculus uh, that is uh, given us by the book of Deuteronomy that is rooted in uh, the Sinai Covenant. So that's uh, how I want to come at this. Now I'll say this and then we'll begin to look at a few texts. Uh, I think that the, uh, the forming of, a, of these prophetic books is that there were ad hoc poems. Uh, I, I get to a lot of churches uh, for a weekend, you know, I, nev I never go to a church that someone doesn't give me a poem they've written. It's just people generate poetry, and it's, it's usually poetry about loss. A woman in uh, Gainesville, Florida last week gave me a beautiful poem that had to do with her grief about the loss of her sister who was young and got cancer and so on. So poetry, poetry just comes and uh, it is said <laughs> like we say about all good art, it's inspired. So I imagine uh, the Jeremiah just kind of did poems. Uh, uh, one commentator says in Hebrew that most of his poems are in a 3-2 meter uh, because that's the meter of grief. I don't know whether that's true, but he was uh, artistically quite competent that's the first step in forming a biblical book, a prophetic book, is ad hoc poems. And if you read the book of Jeremiah, it must have struck you how disordered it is. You don't quite understand how you get from here to here, but that's how poetry works. And then secondly, there is a long, lasted many centuries, hidden, we don't know about it, editorial process that took all of this poetic material and turned it into a scroll or a book. So the assumption is that Jeremiah the poet, he certainly didn't want to use any of his energy editing. You can hire people to do that. So somebody else did that. Now what these editors do, uh, presumably, is that they arrange the material. And you may know if you read the first three Gospels and then you read the fourth Gospel, the Jesus uh, act of cleansing the temple occurs at roughly the same place in the sequence in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but it's a very different place in the fourth Gospel. So that means that the, the makers of the fourth Gospel wanted that text to perform a different function. So editorial work is, uh, is really important in stacking the cards. The second thing they do is that they extend the material so that there's lots of material in the book of Jeremiah that is probably not from Jeremiah, but what the editors said were Jeremiah doing this, this is what he would say. That's what preachers do all the time. I think this is what Matthew meant when he said that. So, and the, the editorial stuff in the book of Jeremiah is by and large prose. So when you read the book of Jeremiah, you want to pay attention uh, to prose and poetry. If you look in uh, Jeremiah 3, uh, 
you see, uh, and it's not hard to, in the Hebrew to determine what's poetry and prose, but you see you have the first five verses of poetry, uh, then you have a prose, and uh, in, the, in the NRSV, is that what we got? The, the NRSV committee has put a call to repentance. So the, the editors, by and large, are moral teachers. They want you to get it right. <laughs> Good poets are not moral teachers. So the poetry is much less didactic and much less insistent but then you get, and then uh, beginning at verse uh, uh, 12, uh, you get some more poetry, and then you get prose again. Now, we don't know uh, that Jeremiah never spoke in prose, uh, but the probability is that, the, that, that um, the prose come later. The third thing they do is they do imposed commentary. So if you look at... Um, uh, chapter 4, uh, I'll come back to this another time if I have time. Chapter 4, 21, uh, I looked on the earth. You see that? Yes. Now, you know, think now, he, he's, he's trying to help us experience 587. That's what he's doing. I looked and behold, it was waste and void. In the heavens there were no light. I looked, and the mountains and the hills were quaking. I looked, and there was no one there. I looked, and the fruitful land was a desert before the fierce anger of the Lord. It's poetry. He's really mad. Now, if you look at those four, I looked, I looked, I looked, I looked, what he's doing is reading creation backward. So he is lining out the undoing of creation. No animals, no human beings, no mountains, no sun and moon. It's not about the end of the world. It's about how to make emotional contact with the loss of the known world. But look at verse 27 in prose. For thus says the Lord, the whole land will be a desolation, yeah. Yet, <laughs> I will not make a full end of it. <laughs> well, either Jeremiah changed his mind, or God changed his mind, or a committee of editors said, that's too harsh, we can't read that in church. <laughs> so we'll soften it by saying, well, I didn't really mean everything's going to end. Now, what I, what I mean to suggest then is that the poetry is uh, open to being tilted in a lot of directions and when we look carefully we can see that the tilting, the interpretive tilting is going on in the book of Jeremiah itself over a long hidden process we don't know who did that. We call them editors or redactors or deuteronomists. Uh, but what they want to do is to try to make some coherent sense out of ad hoc poems. Uh, and uh, I, don't, I don't think that uh, recognizing the editorial process in any way diminishes the thought that this uh, these texts are inspired, uh, but you have to recognize that or you cannot understand the complexity and disjunctions of the text. Now, I'll stop there. Uh, that's all I want to say in general about literature to see whether you have any, uh, any comment or question or whether this makes sense to you or uh, whatever. Yes, Marshall. You were talking about the editors. Uh it points out the beginning about the, the, the original Hebrew text it sets opposite the Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, which tend to be That's right. ruined. So you really had two different sets of editors. We probably had many. You probably had many. If you if you uh, if you remember how the 
Now the map goes, this is the Mediterranean and the Jordan and the Dead Sea and Jerusalem. Uh, the exiles <laughs> were in Babylon, and we know there were exiles in Egypt, and their people remained in Jerusalem. So we have three textual traditions. This is, this is the one from which we get our Hebrew Bible. It's Babylonian. Uh, the, the, the Jews in uh, Egypt spoke Greek, so you get the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation. And I haven't studied this, but what people say is that the, the, the Greek version of the book of Jeremiah is one-eighth longer than the Babylonian version that we have in our Bible. And then you get a Samaritan one, and then the Dead Sea would be another one. So there were, there were uh, many uh, different communities in different contexts that valued the text and did their own editorial work to draw it close to them. And so it's, it's important to recognize that we are, we are reading, because our text comes out of the Babylonian tradition of Jews, uh, we are reading a text that is really an advocacy against these other interpretations. And if you want to, you can call them denominations. So you get a different Bible among the Baptists or among the Quakers or Episcopalians or whoever, which means there is no uh, final Bible behind this, but there are only competing textual traditions. And what we tend to do is to put our buckets down in one, uh, and most of the time we are not aware even that there are others that people are handling differently. You want to come back at that? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Walter. Yes. Uh, you, you said that, um, that in the Hebrew text that it's very obvious the difference between the poetry and the prose. Yeah. How is we get short lines. You get, you get short lines in the Hebrew, whereas in the prose, well, the, the line, I started to go like this, they run this way. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you can see it, they go, the prose goes margin to margin. Okay. There, are, there are probably some texts that are disputed about that, are they prose or poetry, but on the whole, uh, you can tell the difference in the, in the, in the, in the manuscripts. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we ought to, it not being quarter 20 to 8, we ought to talk about some texts. Uh, I'm going to start with uh, right at the beginning, which is a very good place to start, if you look in the beginning. I'm going to spend some time on these first three verses. Now, these first three verses, you can see they're prose. Uh, the Presbyterians just have issued a new hymnal, uh, and uh, all hymnals contain uh, an opening chapter by the hymnal committee, which no one ever reads, but they, they tell you what we thought we were doing. Uh, the, the Presbyterian hymnal is just out, maybe a month, and it's already got the first critique, <laughs> because they got a section of hymnals that says, uh, the covenant of God with Israel. So you would expect that some Palestinian Christians are already objecting that they use that kind of language. Well, they'll have to think for the second edition, and you know, so, so that goes. So this is probably a, an editorial preface. And I want you to see four things about this. The words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, who was an Anatoth in the land of Benjamin. Stop there and hold that and look at 1 Kings 2. This is pretty amazing. In 1 Kings 2, uh, Solomon, uh, uh, verse 26, in this chapter Solomon is killing all of his enemies. David told him to kill all his enemies if he's going to be king. But in 2.26, the king said, to the priest Abiathar, you can't, you can't kill a priest. So what he does is to banish Abiathar because uh, Abiathar had opposed Solomon becoming king. So he says, go to Anatoth, to your family farm, 
as in Deuteronomy, uh, Jeremiah 32, family farm. You ought to be executed, but I will not put you to death at this time uh, because you helped my father. So Solomon banished Abiathar. Now, look back in Jeremiah. And what I want you to see is that Jeremiah is of the priests who were in Anatoth, the place where Abiathar was exiled. So probably 400 years later, that's Jeremiah's family that was banished from Jerusalem. The connection, because, you know, in the Near East, nobody ever forgets anything. <laughs> we had a, an international seminar that I led at Columbia, and we had eight international scholars, and uh, at the beginning of the seminar, we gave every person an hour to introduce himself and tell his life story. And my friend from Hungary, after he used his hour, he was only up to the 13th century. So <laughs> <a> long time. <laughs> now, if that connection is valid, which seems highly probable, that means that Jeremiah comes out of a family of profound resentment <laughs> against the, the Jerusalem establishment. That means for 400 years his family has been thinking Jerusalem has got it wrong. So you, you have to think that these prophets are not innocent, objective guys. Uh, most of them are guys, not all of them. Uh, but they bring all kinds of deep passion to this stuff. And so uh, he wants to make the case that the Torah that has been championed in Anatoth was not valued in Jerusalem. So I'm not surprised that the city was destroyed. The second thing uh, that I want you to see, I think this is very clever. Look at this. The words of Jeremiah, that, that I mean, talking about the book, to whom the word of the Lord came. Now what, what is so interesting about that formulation, the editors do not say that the book of Jeremiah is the word of the Lord. It's the words of Jeremiah, so he allows some wiggle room that there's some, there's some slippage between God's word and the prophet's word. I think this is, this is very shrewd. The third thing, that I want you to see. He, he lists the kings of his timeline. He doesn't mention the two three-month kings. So you get Jeremiah, I'm sorry, Josiah, and then you get Jehoiakim, and then you get Zedekiah. So you get these uh, three uh, kings. And then the last line says, until the captivity uh, we would translate that exile now of Jerusalem. So what this does is to announce that the book of Jeremiah is a meditation on deportation and displacement for which the Hebrew word you may know is Gola. Uh, Gola which then became the diaspora of uh, scattered Jews. So these first three verses uh, really help us locate that this poet who is filled with resentment uh, has been impacted by God's word and is going to discuss the exile and the failure of three kings. That's a kind of an orientation to what we're going to read. Now, look at the last chapter, 52. Verse 28. This is the number of the people whom Nebuchadnezzar took into exile in the seventh year. Remember I told you that uh, 605 is Nebuchadnezzar's date. So the seventh year gives you 598. Uh, then the second one in the 18th year, that'll give you 587. That's our big date. 
and then uh, in the 23rd year, that's 581. So what uh, geo, geopolitically, the, the Babylonian Empire probably wanted access to the Mediterranean Sea. And these little states were in the way, so they wanted to create a path for the sake of their commerce and their military action and so on. Now, look at this. He, he gives you the numbers. The first, the first deportation was 3,032. The, the second deportation in 587 was 800 people. That's all. <laughs> And the third deportation, 745, which, if you add them all up, he says, comes to 4,600 people. Now, what strikes you about these numbers? Small. Very small. It's kind of like, how many, how many people died in 9-11? Mm. Are we now saying 3,000? Yes. Who would have thought the death of 3,000 people could impact our society. So who would have thought that 4,600 people would redirect the imagination of Israel? The other thing that strikes me, comment? Who were the people? They were the leadership. That, they were the leadership. That's, that's the point. That's right. That's right. They were the leadership. Because the theory is if you remove the leadership, the natives will not be restless because they got nobody to organize it. Right. Yep. So uh, the royal family, the priesthood, the scribes, the opinion makers were the ones. The other thing that strikes me is they know, or they claim they claim to know exactly. That's they know the names. This is a very small economy. Everybody important knows everybody important. So the, the word is that both parties have a list of candidates for the Supreme Court. And they all know each other because they all went to Harvard. And now they're all Catholics. It didn't used to be. So they know that. Now, your, your point about this is exactly right. What happened in the emergence of Judaism is that this small group of elite people seized the microphone and they established that our experience is normative for all Jews, even though most of you were never deported. So, so the elites, by and large, determine, well, just look at that the three big networks that are now open, owned by big corporations, they decide what the news is. Amen. And the rest of the stuff, you have to listen to BBC or something outside of us to find out the news. It's, it's highly tasted. The other thing about this, in that paragraph, the word Gola, exile, is used three times. So it's, a, it's like a pounding rhetoric. The seventh year, exile. The 18th year, exile. The 23rd year, exile. And then, if you will look at the last paragraph of the book of Jeremiah, in the 37th year of the exile of King Jehovah, he'd, he'd been in Babylon 37 years. Uh, he's still there, and he's uh, being hosted and recognized by the king of Babylon, but he can't go home. Now hold that and look at 2 Kings 25. Verse 27. In the 37th year, it's the same paragraph. So the makers of the book of Jeremiah what, couldn't figure out how to end the book, so they said, well, just take this and put this over here. You can, it's a marvelous example of, of uh, editing. So what I take so much time with this for is to say that if you take 1, 1 to 3 
And 52, 28 to 30, I'm going to peel off uh, 31 to 34 as an envelope for the book of Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah is bracketed by the reality of 587 displacement and deportation. And that gives you the, the edges in which the editors arranged all of this material um, because it is the overriding social reality. Uh, and uh, what this communicates is that this society is in free fall and nobody knows what comes next because it is so disordered and then that raised the question about whether God has failed and the book of Job is probably written here because the book of Job says in its main argument I haven't sinned enough to have this happen to me so there must be some other uh, way of thinking about this rather than the book of Deuteronomy. So that's, uh, that's how I want to set it up and then I'll move along and, unless you'd like to stop and talk about this. Could you repeat what you just said about Job? Job, Job, Job is a poem in which uh, uh, Job voices a protest against the idea that all these bad things are happening to you because you sinned. And Job says, tell me what I did. I didn't sin. Now, if, if you take Job in context, it's this Deuteronomic theology that says, disobey, get punished, that is the dominant theology it's still the dominant theology among us. That's, that's how we nurtured. And Job says, that doesn't work. It's not true because I am suffering adversity and nobody will tell me what I did wrong. No, that's, that, that's, a, that's presented as a person, but it could be the voice of Israel saying, that way of understanding our life in the world is not adequate to what we are experiencing. So this would be an argument against the dominant view that the destruction of 587 is not because of our sin. Well, maybe it's because of uh, poor leadership. Maybe it's because of Babylonian imperialism. Maybe it's because God is careless and indifferent. They could think of many other explanations rather than the dominant one. But the dominant one is the one you tend to get in the prophets, including Jeremiah. Okay, want to come back at that? Sounds reasonable to me. Okay, good. <laughs> to me, this says a lot about the theme of inspiration. What uh, the whole process, and it's a, I don't know if you want to say a messy, but they're a lot more involved when you say this is the word of the Lord. That's right, that's right. And, and I, I think that's, that's ancient code language for this is important, listen up. I mean, I, I don't doubt, I don't doubt that he thought this came from God, but, but how, are, it, it's, not, it's not dictated by God. So who knows how any, how any artist is inspired, because if you ask a, a poet or a songwriter or a storyteller, how'd you get that, uh, they're likely to say, it just came to me, it just came to me. Well, if you ask, where did it come from, they're not likely to say, but in the ancient world, they say, well, it came from God. No problem with that. Yeah, right. Thank you. Good. Well, yes. back to the timeline. If, if Jeremiah is bracketed by the beginning, on the beginning side of the destruction of J Jerusalem, what is the length of time that we're looking at until the end of what he's talking about. Is it a hundred years? Is it four hundred? Well, the, the, the common assumption is that uh, 587 and exile lasted until 540. And the reason for that is that Persia, which is Iran, 
defeated Babylon, which is Iraq, and Cyrus, the Persian, permitted the Jews to go home. So look in Isaiah 45. Uh, this, this poetry is commonly dated 540 in Isaiah. Thus says, now look at this, thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus the Persian. Now what's the Hebrew word for anointed? Messiah. Messiah. So he said, a goy, a non-Jew, is the Messiah. Who will save my people? Now you can tell in Isaiah 45, there were some people that didn't want to be saved by that goy. And they must have said, I ain't going home till the Jew takes us home. So in verse 9, <laughs> woe to you, woe to you stubborn Jews, woe to you who strive with your maker, that is argue with God, does, a, does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Or does the clay say, I don't think you got the handles right? No, the clay just keeps turning. Woe to the fetus, or to the sperm, who says to the father, hey, what you doing there? And who says to the mother in labor, how come you're grunting? So, no, the fetus just keeps moving. So the Jews ought to keep moving. They ought not to question God. So you can see that, that argument over here about whether this is the real Messiah. But historically, uh, a lot of Jews didn't want to go home. But the, wins, the ones who went home then, in the next generations, rallied around Ezra. And that's where you get the formation of Judaism then, of these people, of the Babylonians who came home to Jerusalem. So Judaism is essentially a product of Babylonian Jews. But that's, uh, that's uh, just beyond the book of Jeremiah probably. We don't, we don't quite know where this collection ended. It certainly, uh, the, the book of Jeremiah certainly goes a generation beyond the person of Jeremiah because he, he couldn't have lasted that long, so, yeah. Well, I want to do uh, two things yet. Uh, the first one that I want to do is to talk about Jeremiah 4, 1, 4 to 10, which is commonly called uh, uh, term the call of Jeremiah or the credentialing the credentialing of the person of Jeremiah or the credentialing of the book of Jeremiah it could be either and I, I picked out uh, what I think are the salient points I no, notice in verse 5 notice all the first person pronouns of God I formed you, I knew you, I consecrated you, I appointed you. Now, you know, uh, there are now uh, uh, anti-abortion bumper stickers, uh, I formed you in the womb, that that's, doesn't have to do with that. It has to do with a prophetic call. So, uh, the, the, uh, the, this verse wants to claim that Jeremiah being a prophet was not Jeremiah's idea. Uh, in fact, in verse 6, he resists the call, uh, and he says, I don't want to do it because I'm too young and I can't talk right, and please get somebody else. This is exactly the same thing Moses said when uh, uh, God wanted him to go to Pharaoh. Same, same pattern. And in verse 7, God says to Jeremiah, shut up! <laughs> and don't be afraid. And then he says in verse 10, you can look at the other verses, I have appointed you, you get a point in verse 5, and then you get a point in verse 6, I have 
designated you, I have empowered you, I have authorized you <coughs> to be a prophet to the nations. We'll come back to that, maybe, if we can remember it. Now, this verse 10, I think, is the best verse for trying to read the book of Jeremiah. It has six verbs. It has four negative verbs. So, so Jeremiah's task is to do four negative things. <coughs> to pluck up and tear down, to destroy and overthrow. And pluck up is, is language used for uh, pulling a plant out of the ground, to pluck it up, and to tear down it refers to the destruction of a wall or a, uh, a building or something like that, a fortress. So, and I think it's, I think it's helpful to see that Jeremiah is not told, I want you to talk about plucking up and tearing down. I want you to talk about, I, I don't want you to talk about it, I want you to do it. And the way he does it is by artistic imaginative speech. Speech destroys worlds. That's why language is so important. So the, the big argument that's been going on for a long time now in the church is using masculine language for God. And the people that like to call God Father, only Father, say, well, it doesn't matter. We just call him Father, because it really doesn't matter, except that they are so insistent on it, you know it matters. <laughs> because calling God Father will help you maintain a patriarchal world. And when you slip in uh, Mother God, uh, you are plucking up and tearing down. So all of these poems that are really quite offensive are attempts to undo the imagined world of privilege in which the elite. So Jeremiah Wright turned out to be any too popular, but Jeremiah's uh, Jeremiah Wright's sermon about goddamn America, what he was doing was plucking up and tearing down. And of course, that got on the airwaves and quoted out of context and all that happened. But that's what a poet does. So the language that Jeremiah Wright used, very offensive. But no more offensive than Jeremiah. Uh, we'll see, we'll look at some of that next week. Uh, these two words, destroy and overthrow are not as much used, so I don't need to talk about that. But then, uh, Jeremiah's second mandate is to plant, that means put the growth back in the ground, to build, to resurrect the wall, to plant and to build, which is the language of restoration. So Jeremiah, in sequence, has two tasks up to 587 is to pluck up and tear down, and after 587 is to plant and to build. Now what we like to do in the church, we like to skip over this one and do this one. So we like to be positive and constructive and hopeful, uh, but in the Jeremiah sequence that comes too soon. So this poetry, if you take that as a theme, this poetry is to walk Jerusalem imaginatively, artistically, poetically, to walk Jerusalem into the abyss. Because they are engaged in huge denial they say, oh, the housing market is rebounding. Oh, we've reached the bottom of the recession. Oh, we'll soon have employment again. Think about that. And then the second task, well, I said descent into the abyss, or I use the language of the Apostles' Creed, he descent into hell. Hell, abyss, Golah. 
I think in our society that's what we're walking into. And we're going to have more and more anger. Uh, the people that have a lot are going to say it's class war against them. The people that don't have a lot uh, don't want to be left behind anymore. So there you go. That's what they had. And then the second step is to is resurrection from the abyss or resurrection from hell. On the third day he rose again and ascended. Now if you will look in uh, Ezekiel uh, 37, you see this language. This is familiar to you, even if you don't know the number. <laughs> uh, Ezekiel 37. Uh, verse 3. God says to Ezekiel, you think these bones can live? He's talking about the hopeless people in exile. Can these bones live? And Ezekiel says, uh, you're God. You're the one that's supposed to know. This is, this is where you get the hip bone connected to the knee bone, all that kind of stuff. But then look at verse uh, 13. Therefore, thus says the Lord God. Uh, verse 13. Therefore, says the Lord God. I am going to open your graves, he's talking about the exile, and bring you back to the land, and you shall know that I am Yahweh when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves. I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you on your own land, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act. So the language of death and resurrection in the Old Testament is rooted in the crisis of 587 in which the prophetic task is to use artistic imagination to help people face up to what's happening. And to plant and to build is to imagine a new possibility that is God-given and God-guaranteed, the shape of which we cannot go. Well, you see that this is the shape of uh, what we confess about Jesus of Nazareth. So N.T. Wright has said that Jesus of Nazareth reperforms the history of Israel. And Saturday is dwelling in the abyss and you know that uh, traditionally uh, we have three hour uh, services on Good Friday traditionally because that is the time of darkness when death seemed to have triumph over the power of God in Jesus. So you can see all of that going on here and uh, if you, if you uh, want to read this text with some contemporaneity uh, then you sort of have to ask where do you, where do you think we're located here? And uh, that, that's, a, that's a question of some debate among us. So what I'm going to do for the other Wednesdays that we have is uh, spend a Wednesday night on this and spend a Wednesday night on this and then I'll think of something to do on the fourth Wednesday night. <laughs> now, do you have a comment or question? Is that a sigh? <laughs> Yes? Um, I couldn't see the board up there to see what you were underlining about what we're going to do. Well, it doesn't matter. Oh, oh, oh. oh. <laughs> so we're we're going to do, do a Wednesday night on pluck up and tear down, and a Wednesday night on plan and build. Mm. Yeah. Now I want to show you, how are we doing time? Four other texts. In uh, Ezekiel, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 18. I put these up here so you can see them. Jeremiah 18, 7 to 9. 7 to 9. Th th this, this paragraph is about uh, Jeremiah going to a potter's house. He watches a potter making a pot. And what he observes is the potter makes the pot 
and then he looks at it and it didn't turn out right, so the potter smashes it and rolls the clay and starts over. So that's, that's the sermon illustration. <laughs> and then he says, at one moment, God says, uh, well, verse, verse 6, just like the clay in the hand of the potter, so are you in my hand, the house of Israel. At one moment I may declare concerning a nation, that would be Judah, or kingdom, that I will pluck up and break down and destroy. There you get three verbs. But if that nation turns from its evil, I, God, will change my mind. At another time, I may declare concerning a nation or a kingdom that I will build and plant. But if, that, but if it does evil, then I will change my mind. Uh, and so the conclusion in verse uh, 11 is turn, that means repent, all of you from your evil ways. Because if you turn, you can avert the plucking up and tearing down. But look at verse 12. <laughs> but they said, no, I don't think so. We'll follow our own plans. Jeremiah is saying that's what they said. So this is a second use of our verbs uh, in, in which it is announced that uh, Jerusalem gets to decide whether they get plucking up and tearing down or building and planting. The second text in chapter 24, this is a later text, uh, so um, uh, this is addressed to exiles. You see, uh, it says in verse 1, this was after Nebuchadnezzar had taken into exile from Jerusalem King Jehoiakim, so you can date it that way. Uh, and he says, I will, verse 6, I will set my eyes on them, on the exiles, for good, and I will bring them back to the land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am Yahweh. Now, if you read that whole text, it's about good figs and bad figs. And, and the, the people in Babylon wrote this text to say the bad figs are the Jews that stayed in Jerusalem. They got no future. The good figs are us. <laughs> and God now is going to plant and build. So uh, 26, 24, verse 6, is a, a promise of restoration. In 31, uh, 28, We'll look at verse 27. The days are surely coming. We don't know when, but it's coming. When I will plant the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of humans and the seed of all restore creation, just as I watched over them to pluck up and tear down and overthrow and destroy and bring evil. Now you got five negative verbs. Pluck up, break down, overthrow, destroy, bring evil. I did that. Now, I will watch over them to plant and build. Yes? I'm a little confused. Um, when you go back and you were talking about Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy and uh, if you obey the laws, you will be yep. successful. If you do not, you will need adversity. Okay, now. Jeremiah believes this, and he thinks that some of the Jews have not followed this thought. The leadership in Jerusalem. Okay, now yep. what did you say about the ones who were Greek? What happened to them? They also were exiled, but they, they fled to Egypt yes. rather than being carried away into Babylon, but the, but the Jews who are in Egypt do not reckon much in the Bible because the Bible is put together by Babylonian Jews. But Jeremiah is not criticizing them at this point. He's no, criticizing the, the, the Well, this is earlier. His criticism is before 587. 
and he's talking to the people in Jerusalem. After that, you get him carried to Babylon to the north or to Egypt in the south. Then he has a different message, but his message up to 587 is addressed to the power elite in Jerusalem. So everything he's saying in Jeremiah is back to this mosaic that well, everything, everything that reflects that, but then when you, when you get to plant and build, he moves beyond that, which is, which is so strange. Because the book of Deuteronomy, that's a closed system. But, but prophetic imagination breaks out of the closed system to say that's not God's last word. God's last word is that I will restore you and I will forgive you and you will come home. Because the Mosaic law pretty much is it's in your power as a human being to make these decisions whether you're going to succeed or fail. That's right. But when you get on to this later part, it's more God's That's right, because, because at that point they had no capacity any longer to help themselves because they were under the domination of the Babylonians, which in the New Testament becomes under the domination of Satan, sin, and death. Whether you're under the domination of Satan, sin, and death, or Babylon, you're helpless. I guess I'm really always interested in the Bible where it's putting the sense of personal responsibility and what you're supposed to be responsible for and what you sort of push off on God. And it seemed to me when we were reading this 365 that we really put an awful lot onto God to do all this stuff for us. That's right. We weren't accepting much of the responsibility as individual humans to well, the, the, make the, the, these choices for ourselves. No, the prophets, the prophets, by and large, say you're responsible for this. Right. So what 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 you get is a is a exchange between prophetic oracle and psalms of lament. The prophetic oracles blame Israel. The Psalms of Lament tend to blame God, which of course is why we don't use them. <laughs> We're getting Phil to do that, and Roger's been using some of them. So, so it's, it's like marital counseling. If a, if, a, if a counselor sees both parties at the same time, the conversation begins by both parties saying, you're at fault. That, that's, if you put these two literatures together, that's what you get. But we read, we read one side of it, uh, uh, well, we, we're reading one side of it now, in which Israel is responsible for its failure. But after 587, there's not much talk of that anymore. Now, uh, there is lament in the Book of Lamentations, and then there is a a new announcement that God is ready to forgive and deliver and save and bring home. But I think the way it's all arranged, you cannot say this stuff too early. If you say it over here, you just encourage denial. So they don't, they don't do that. Does that make sense? Oh, yes. I, I think I need to have it said a lot of times. Well, I'm going to say it. I'm going to say the same thing for four Wednesday nights. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say it slow enough to last an hour and 15 minutes. <laughs> okay, the, the third text, I'll just comment on these. 31, 28. Now, this, this text will interest you, ma'am, because look at this. Uh, it's not the text I want to talk about, but look at verse 29. In those days, everybody with me? No. 31, 29. In those days it will no longer be said, quote, 
the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. That, that is, they used to say the children and the grandchildren to the fourth generation have to pay for what the parents did. But that will no longer be said. Now you get something like this generation is only responsible for its own actions, not the actions of the previous generations. But you see, we, we, still, we still pretty much operate the other way. We're, we're still paying the price for slavery. I heard an amazingly ironic statement. The, the uh, governor of Georgia, uh, of Florida today, has taken new action uh, to get bad voters off the rolls. Oh. And you know what that's about. Sure. Yeah. Do you know where the report came from? The reporter said, signed off, I'm speaking to you from Plantation, Florida. <laughs> I thought, oh. that's what he said. I'm not making it up. I said, wow, well, of course he's speaking from Plantation, Florida. <laughs> <laughs> but the text I want to, the, the verse I want to see is in front of that. So this is a late text. Just as I have watched over them to pluck up, break down, overthrow, destroy, and bring evil. Five. I've done that. I've done that. So now I will plant and build. And the fifth text in 45. Now this is an earlier text. Verse 4, thus says the Lord, I am going to break down what I have built and pluck up what I have planted, that is, the whole land. Goodbye. <laughs> now, do you notice anything about those four texts in light of what I've said tonight? They're editorial texts. They're all prose. <coughs> They're editorial. So what you can see, probably, is that an editor is thematizing. He's giving order and coherence to this ad hoc poetry to say, what well, all the poetry is about are these four verbs. So plucking up and tearing down is walking people into failure, into, into, into punishment, destruction, disportment, displacement, free fall, plant and build, are walking out of 587. So this, this task is to penetrate the denial. In which, you know, if you're, if you're tenured like I've been most of my life, before Roger was born I was tenured. <laughs> It's not the same as saying before you were born I knew you and I was tenured. <laughs> but if you're tenured and if you got your house paid for, if you're secure, I don't see any problem. I think everything's I think everything's just working. So they engage in a lot of denial. Over here they couldn't deny. Now they were in despair. Because there's nothing we can do. So the poetry needs to counter denial. And then it means to counter despair. So I think uh, uh, when you read any text from Jeremiah, it, it doesn't work schematically, but it's always a good question to ask, uh, where are we located when we, when we read a text because they are, uh, they are uh, disordered uh, in important ways. I think that's uh, all I came prepared to say. Uh, I, I would invite you to uh, uh, to reflect uh, if you're coming back next Wednesday to reflect on how this map uh, uh, might illuminate our social situation and how it might identify what the important work of the church is. if we live in a culture of denial or if we live in a culture of despair or just a culture of free fall. In the future too as to who you think the prophets today are that are in Jeremiah. Well, we, we all have our list. 
Yeah. I suppose Martin Luther King's on everybody's list. I got a I got a note from Henry Zorn today. Did you get one? Mm -mm. The Lutheran pastor, in which he shared with me that Jim Wallace has picked out um, two thousand texts in the Bible about justice, and he is inviting clergy to come to the Capitol and read those two thousand texts over and over and over. Jim Wallace calls it uh, some kind of filibuster. I think Jim Wallace is a prophet. Uh, you know, we all, have, we all have our candidates. And you also would want to ask who are the false prophets? Who are, li who are, who are lying to us about our situation? And we won't, we won't agree on who the true ones are, or the, but, but it's, a good, it's a good thing to, to see whether you can uh, identify people like that. Yeah. I think over the long run, Dan Berrigan has been a, the, the great Jesuit has been a, a great prophetic figure. Uh, but, you know. Uh, Bill Moyers? Bill Moyer? Yep. yep. Wendell Berry? Wendell Berry, for sure, Wendell Berry. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Who speaks in a poetic idiom. <laughs> yep. Well, anything else? Thank you for uh, engaging this. I think it's uh, I think it's really urgent that we uh, think together about these things. Good. Walter, well, thank you. And um, as always, um, if you want to try to decipher Walter's writing, you can come back afterwards and <laughs> <laughs> Just a reminder that next the next three weeks we have potluck at six. If you want to come, you want to bring something, fine. If you don't want to bring something, come anyway. And then uh, the program will begin at uh, a seven. Um, and let's close with a prayer. The Lord be with you. Also with you. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks for Jeremiah. We give you thanks for his willingness to confront the denial of his time. May we have the courage to look at our situation. May we know that you will go with us as we look into the depths of the abyss. And as always, you will promise to raise us from the dead through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Have a good evening. Thank you.